from Washington, D.C., this is Middle East Focus. Welcome to Middle East Focus. I'm Alistair Taylor, MEI's editorial director, and today we're going to be talking about Iran, U.S. policy, and the potential impact of the upcoming U.S. elections. Thankfully, we've got three great guests on the program today to help us make sense of things. Alex Vitanka, Azila Fati, and Nazi Moinian. Alex is a senior fellow and the director of the Iran program here at MEI. Nazil is a journalist, non-resident scholar with MEI's Iran program, former New York Times correspondent, and the author of Lonely War, One Woman's Account of the Struggle for Modern Iran. Nazil is a doctoral candidate at the University of St. Andrews School of History, a non-resident scholar with MEI's Iran program, a foreign policy advisor, writer, and documentary filmmaker. Alex, Nazil, and Nazi, thank you all for joining us today, and welcome to the program. Thank you. Thanks, Alex. Thank you. Alex, let's start off with you. Iran has been a major priority, if not the major priority, when it comes to U.S. Middle East policy under the Trump administration. How has the administration's approach to Iran changed or evolved over the past nearly four years now? I'm not sure it's evolved much, to be honest. I think it's been a uh, hawkish, if you will, policy from get-go, and um, I think it's been consistent throughout. I think obviously the rhetoric has been uh, very clear in terms of what the Trump administration wants to see from the Islamic Republic, which is a change of its policies, primarily in the uh, context of the nuclear program, uh, but also what Iran does in the region. But in terms of the instruments that the administration has brought to the table to shape Iranian calculations, I don't see much of a change. I think it's been pretty much consistent going back to early January 2017, which began obviously with the sort of promise of tougher align unless Iran made concessions, the Iranians didn't. And we ended up with the sort of sanctions regime tightening gradually from late 2018 onwards. What I don't see, and I wish we had seen more of, was more of a diplomatic effort by the Trump administration to broaden the campaign, if you will, if the intention was to change Iranian behavior. We have put the uh, idea of multilateralism on the sidelines. Uh, Principally, the European uh, allies of the United States have not been with us on this one. That uh, I think its history will prove to have been a major uh, mistake. There's never even been an issue to sort of have a dialogue with the Russians and the Chinese on the question of Iran, specifically on Iran's nuclear program, which is also a concern for certainly the Russians and the Chinese. We we kind of gave up on that conversation be, before we even had it. We've done nothing in terms of serious regional alliance building, I think, uh, I, and people, and I love to talk about this going forward. People will say, what are you talking about? What What is going on in the Middle East? It's all about Iran. I'm not so convinced. And, and I give you one example. I think if Iran was our number one priority, we should have ended as quickly as possible, the internal uh, Gulf Cooperation Council fight between Qatar, Saudi Arabia, and UAE, and some other Arab states, because that did not help uh, the campaign against Iran. It it split, if you will, pro-U.S. allies at a time where we needed the focus to be on Iran. Militarily, the U.S. has not really done much either. I mean, we had that uh, spectacular assassination of Qasem Soleimani in January of this year, 2020, but again, um, there hasn't really been much except keeping the red lines. I think the United States military muscle is one instrument the Iranian regime respects more than anything else. We could have done more with it. For domestic political reason, President Trump decided not to go there. And we can discuss whether that's good or bad. And final point I make, Alistair, is the biggest instrument any American president or any American administration has against the Islamic Republic is that deep, deep uh, level of anger and resentment you find inside the Iranian uh, population against the Iranian regime. So it's incredibly important not to underestimate how unpopular the Islamic Republic is and has been for many years. The Trump administration, to my mind, has done very little to tap into that. So when I look at the Iranian opposition today, I see one that's angrier than ever before, but I don't really see any more unity. And I think the Trump administration could have done more to tap into that anger, turn the Iranian opposition into a real instrument of pressure against the, the Iranian regime in Tehran. And on that level, we, we didn't really go anywhere. So those are the sort of key points I, I put out on the table. Nazi, on the issue of the maximum pressure campaign specifically, 
You wrote an article in the Daily Beast late last year in which you said that it was working and you urged the administration to stay the course. A year on, how do you assess the, the current situation? I am cognizant of the fact that Iran historically uh, responds to pressure. We saw that in 2003 when the U.S. invaded Iraq and uh, then Foreign Minister Harazi produced a white paper basically accommodating the U.S., on many key points, uh, that letter did not get anywhere. And, you know, Bush administration soon banded Iran uh, as part of the access to Israel with Iraq and Syria. And that kind of angered the Iranians. But we we can see the same thing with the passing of the resolution, UN Security Council Resolution 598, which prompted both Iran and Iraq to end the eight-year brutal war, to which the Supreme Leader Khomeini, the leader of the revolution, said, I will do this, but it's like drinking from the poison of chalice. So Iran, when it comes to having an existential moment when it's the survival of the regime or accommodation, accommodates the international community more or less on its own terms. So by writing that article, uh, which actually came out a few days before Qasem Soleimani was killed, astonishingly, I was trying to bring out the nuances of what a regime uh, will do uh, faced with extreme economic and military pressure. The real has devalued by half since last year. I think it's at 42,000 reals for $1. It was twice as much last year this time, and maybe a little bit more or less. And inflation is at its all-time high. There is crony capitalism. Uh, the IRGC is trying to capitalize on the market, the black market, at the expense of Iranians. Iranians are cognizant of that. And astonishingly, as much as America and Khamenei and the clerics around Khamenei would like to put the onus on the American administration by blaming the sanction regime for the economic malaise that has gripped the nation, Iranians themselves are leery of doing that. And nothing is more telling, in my opinion, uh, when President Trump came down with COVID and there was a deafening silence in Iran in the newspaper about his condition. Khamenei did not want to wish him well because he was the person who ordered the assassination of Qasem Soleimani. So that would have looked bad. And he didn't want to wish him bad either, because that would have angered the Iranian people. So in a way, I think the maximum pressure is working in giving voice to the Iranian people who have witnessed their hopes and dreams, economic ambitions for their children, for the future generations crushed under the ideology of this regime. In my opinion, it hasn't gone far enough. But aside from that, I don't think there is a plan to take this leverage to the bank and cash it in. What is? How are we going to bring the Iranians to the table if so far they have not uh, shown any inclination to do so? So I agree with Alex that the, the administration should have done a much better job at empowering the Iranians, the dissidents outside of Iran who are working hard to be the face of and the voice of the Iranian population within Iran. They haven't done a good job at it, but I haven't given up hope that this administration or the next will recognize that the key to bringing this regime to a more accommodating behavior is to engage both the population and probably the leadership to create a kind of division that will create a fissure enough so that they can moderate their behavior. Nazi touched on this just now, but I wanted to get your thoughts as well. How has the maximum pressure campaign affected the lives of regular Iranians, as well as the popular perception of, of the government in Tehran? Well, I mean, the maximum pressure has completely crushed lower class Ira Iranians, as well as middle class, and perhaps part of the upper class Iranians. Uh, if that was the goal of maximum pressure, well, it has succeeded. In addition to that, uh, you know, it has really sapped hope in 
the fact that public officials in Iran are capable of bringing about a change in the country. And that is a big worry for a lot of people because people stayed away from the polls this year. Parliament was very easily won by conservatives. And presidential elections are coming up next week. And if if the same thing happens, uh, the presidency would be win by the conservative forces in Iran. So, um, I mean, in terms of internal politics, in terms of uh, social change, in terms of economic development, it has succeeded in uh, crushing all those inside the country. But if the goal of maximum pressure was to force Iranians to return to the negotiation table uh, over Iran's nuclear program, uh, I think it has completely failed. If it is reasonable to believe that President Trump is in office for just a few more months, after that, we're going to have a Biden presidency. I think it is fair to say that Iran will try to survive these a few more months and see what it can negotiate with a new administration. Nazi, next I'd like to turn to the upcoming U.S. presidential elections, as Nazila just touched on. But before we we delve into the potential impact on U.S. policy towards Iran, I first wanted to touch on how it's being perceived within Iran. How's the Iranian media portraying the election? It depends on which media, which newspaper, which outlet you're listening to, like everywhere else in the world. It's a divided country. It's really not a monolithic country at all. It has never been, and more so now after 40 years of a brutal regime cracking down on its own people. So if you, uh, from the Twitter feeds and the blogs that I have been reviewing, it seems as if the lay Iranian on the street is very much tuned into the presidential elections. They talk about it. They, They compare what Biden said the night before to what Trump has reacted or has acted. It's always about Trump's theatrics with the Iranians. But also there is a curious silence recently. And I think that has to do with the unfortunate COVID situation in Iran, which is at its height. Yesterday was the worst day. Uh, There were 346 deaths in Iran and 7,000 more cases um, recognized, positive cases. That's not good for a country that's already reeling from economic sanctions and and, uh, corruption and social isolation, political isolation. It's almost a perfect storm, and it seems to be a test of how much this regime or the Iranian people are being able to withstand. But having said that, I, I think there is a very curious obsession with presidential elections. They tune in, again, more for the theatrics and the animation and the interesting things that uh, President Trump would say, and also for their future. This is a country that's sophisticated. They're tuned in. uh, They're the third most tuned in country to the internet after America and uh, China. They understand what's going on around the world, and that's partly how they view their situation. They compare themselves to countries like Turkey and uh, Dubai, uh, two countries that before the revolution were nowhere near the Iranian healthy economy and political stability. And now they have overcome all obstacles. And the UAE is uh, one of the interesting places to go to. It's showing extreme stability. It's signing on Abraham Accords. It's BFF with Israel and U.S., and Iranians understand that this is a fault of their own leadership and not of America. So regardless of whether the government spokesperson, for example, yesterday or today, because of our difference, I think it was today that that Mr. Rabi said, we do not care who becomes the president of the United States. I think the facts are starkly different. It's an obsession um, by all measures, sidelined by the bad news on COVID. Alex, looking ahead to the potential results of the U.S. election, under a hypothetical second term, President Trump has given little indication that he would pursue a strategy other than maximum pressure. But he's also asserted on several occasions that he would be able to quickly reach a deal with Iran in his second term. 
Given the current situation, does any sort of a, a deal seem likely to you? And is there anything that might make the Trump administration adopt a different approach were it to win a second term? Alistair, before I answer that question, if I may just build on some of the things that Nazi and Nazila just pointed out, because I think they're so important. I mean, look, yeah, you you definitely, if you're an Iranian right now living in the Islamic Republic, you have to deal with this new terrible phenomenon called COVID-19, which is just refusing to go away. And obviously Iran is not alone, but the Iranians have been now suffering since January of this year. So we're pushing for a full year where COVID-19 crisis is coinciding with the tightening of the sanctions, uh, which are, again, important to point out. No country, to my knowledge, has ever gone through anything like this in the history of mankind. So we can only assume that these are, are hurting a lot of people. Uh, and again, you can discuss whether this was the best policy option the Trump administration had or not. But I want to also point out the final issue here that I think is is a very important to keep in mind, which is COVID might be about a year old, sanctions might about be two years old, but the mismanagement, the corruption, and the distance that this Iranian regime has with its own people goes back to 1979. So, you know, I can sit here and, and give you a long list of things that they are doing in Iran, the Iranian regime is doing to its own people that has nothing to do with Trump or President Obama, or a possible President Biden. I'll give you one example. Authorities in northern Iran this week went up to a cemetery and wiped off pictures of women, women who had been buried, and wiped off their images that had been printed on their gravestones because they called it uh, un-Islamic. And the, you, know, you can imagine the anger in those small communities where this was done. This is just one vivid but most recent example from this week and i could give you examples from the week before the the week before fundamentally the iranian regime's problem is not the united states it's that it's pursuing policies that your average iranian just does not have any time for or see themselves want to live in that kind of a society and that's not going to go away regardless of what happens in the american elections that's that's a judgment call by ayatollah ali khamenei the supreme leader or whoever's going to succeed him but Alistair, to your point about uh, you know whether a deal is possible going forward after the U.S. elections, it comes down to the question of what kind of a deal. I mean, what are the parameters for the deal? What what is each side asking for? I think a President Trump in his second term, not worried about his re-election again, probably would have more interest and more space to maneuver for a deal with the Iranians on the Iranian side. The idea of going through another four years of the sanctions they're under right now, I just can't see them wanting to take that risk. So it's going to be very tough for them to want to bite the bullet and talk to President Trump, who has, in terms of style, really made it hard for someone stubborn. And let's not forget, the Iranian Supreme Leader Ayatollah Ali Khamenei is a very stubborn man. And a lot of what we, we're witnessing right now is because of his personality, I think, personally, and his refusal to want to succumb to, to what he calls American bullying. And President Trump hasn't helped, you know, calling him all sorts of names, mass murderers and this and that. So President Trump 2.0 would not be welcome news in Tehran. But at the same time, I'm not sure if they can afford to ignore it. And just live under the sanctions and hope for the best in another four years' time because there might be another Trump type of American president. I mean, how do we know that we're going to go back to the JCP of 2015? There are no guarantees that's ever going to happen again. And I also want to point out, if Trump administration is serious about it, they have to start off by answering a simple question, which they have not done the last four years almost, which is what is it they want? Do they want regime change in Tehran? Do they want to see a whole new system of government? Or do they want to cut a deal with this current Iranian Islamic Republic of Iran? That's a fundamental question that you have to answer before you do anything. They haven't answered that question. And I don't think they're going to make any serious headway till they get to a point where they decide what it is they want to do. I think the Biden presidency has made it clear that they're preoccupied with going back to the nuclear deal of 2015 and everything else is kind of secondary. And I also say this about a Biden presidency, because he hasn't really called them names and he hasn't 
Uh, he is the, the legacy of the Obama administration since he was vice president when last time Iran and U.S. cut a deal. A Biden presidency provides the Ayatollahs in Tehran and the Revolutionary Guards with a public face-saving option. So they can say, yeah, yeah, we'll talk to the Americans, but we're not talking to Trump. So, yeah, I see those kinds of dynamics really being at the heart of it the next few weeks and months as, as we see who will win the presidency in the United States and how the Iranian regime decides to adapt itself to, to that reality. Listen, I'm curious to get your thoughts on this as well. Building on what Alex just said, what sort of approach do you think a Biden administration might take towards Iran? And what would be your kind of expectations for how successful that might be? Well, Biden has to find a balanced approach, one that can be implemented step by step. But unfortunately, Biden may not have the time to negotiate with Iran. As I said before, Iran's presidential elections are coming up in spring. The current president, President Rouhani, who is a centrist and more willing to negotiate with the United States, might be out of the office before any real negotiations begin. On the other hand, uh, it would be very hard uh, for Biden to regain the confidence of Iranians. Going back uh, to JCPOA may not just be feasible. There have been some suggestions that Iran may ask for compensation for what it suffered under maximum pressure. But in the meantime, there are a lot of issues that uh, Biden has to address. Iran has reversed some of its obligations uh, under uh, the JCPOA, so it needs to reduce its stockpile of low and rich uranium. It needs to dismantle advanced centrifuges in the hands and stop research and development that go beyond the JCPOA. And none of that easy uh, when there is no trust between the two countries. And in the meantime, Biden has to address the issue of Iran's ballistic missiles, its meddling in the region. So uh, it's not like Biden has said that he's going to return to the agreement, but it is uh, much more challenging than what it sounds. Alex, in a piece you wrote for MEI recently, you also pointed out that even if Biden wanted to join the rejoin the JCPOA and kind of bring back the, the 2015 status quo, there are some key differences in the Iranian domestic landscape compared to five years ago that might make that quite challenging. Can you elaborate on that? I mean, and there are two th- points that I really wanted to make uh, by saying that. One is, don't forget that you have a, uh, you know, you have a lively political sort of scene in Tehran. You have an 81-year-old supreme leader who is busy right now, not just making sure the country doesn't implode, but also making sure that he does what he can do to pave the way for his chosen one to succeed him when he passes on. And the succession process is the elephant in the room here. The key actors, interest groups, primarily the office of the Supreme Leader and the generals and the Revolutionary Guards are very determined to make sure that they sideline anyone who might oppose a risk to their plans in terms of who should succeed Ayatollah Khamenei. Uh, One of the reasons why President Hassan Rouhani is under so much pressure, including calls by a leading member of the Iranian parliament to have him hanged 1,000 times, which was so grotesque of a call that even Khamenei this week had to come out and say, please calm it down, don't be unfair to Rouhani. But the hardliners who go after Rouhani know that Khamenei kind of quietly has their back because they have agreed that Rouhani shouldn't have a chance to, to be the person who who succeeds Khamenei as Supreme Leader, because we know Rouhani aspires to be a potential candidate for the next Supreme Leadership. So long story short, Alistair, don't forget that there is politics in Tehran, like there is politics in Washington, and the issue of what to do with the United States for the Iranians very much will be seen as a factor that can shape the outcome of that succession process. So, you know, they might be playing hardball, till that succession process is over, and then they might loosen. I mean, I can imagine a scenario where the Revolutionary Guards would be much more accommodating to some of Washington's regional demands once they know they have the succession process in uh, captured, secured. But when that happens, that's anybody's guess. I mean, Khamenei could pass on tomorrow. He could be around for another 15 years. That's anybody's guess. And the other thing I said about the Biden challenge facing Iran is, 
you know, if you go back to the May of 2018 list of demands that Secretary Pompeo put out there, I believe three of the 12 demands related to the nuclear issue, seven were about what Iran does in the region. So the notion that you can have a new deal and limit yourself to the nuclear issue and make that deal a sustainable one, one that unlike the 2015 one will not face you know, opposition from the Congress as the Obama deal with Iran did, then you, you really have to broaden the conversation with Tehran. So, you know, any realistic deal, uh, if Washington and Tehran want to be sort of uh, clear-eyed or wide-eyed about this, is to make sure they broaden the conversation, which is exactly what the Trump administration was asking for. But you could argue it went about it the wrong way. It, it put the emphasis on the pressure tactics. Biden can do something different. Keep the leverage that these sanctions have brought about. Uh, because the Iranians really want to see these sanctions gone. That's leverage in the hands of a Biden presidency. But at the same time, give the Iranians an exit option if Biden decides that he wants to talk to this Iranian regime and doesn't want to pursue regime change, which, as I said earlier, the Trump administration never made up its mind. If it did, it never let anybody know about it and just confused everyone who, who was a stakeholder. Now, see, building on what Alex just said, uh, were Biden to win the White House, what lessons should he learn from the mistakes of the Obama and Trump administrations when it comes to Iran? That's an excellent question. I am hopeful that President Biden will be there in the White House in January, more so um, than anything. I mean, uh, notwithstanding the domestic political landscape in America that's very divided right now. We need a uniter in chief rather than a divider in chief. I believe that Biden is perfectly positioned to capitalize on the leverage that the previous administration has uh, accumulated over the past two years with Iran. The two key advisors to President would be Biden are Jake Sullivan and Tony Blinken. And they both have articulated their crazy support for the maximum pressure campaign uh, in different words. And I don't know if it's a matter of semantics that they've said almost the same thing differently. Tony Blinken has said that he will go back to the negotiating table and negotiate further concessions for a better deal. And Jake Sullivan has said the same thing differently, saying that he will negotiate first First is my word, that's not what he used, but uh, I'm paraphrasing him. And then we'll sit at the negotiating table. But it just shows to me that it's probably a continuation of uh, Trump's, I want to say, on policy towards Iran. Uh, it's been kind of chaotic, so it's not a coherent policy. And I'm hoping that the Biden administration will know enough to be able to extract the concessions that is needed. Look, it's already five years past the uh, JCPOA, and one of the terms, which was the arms embargo of the sale and manufacture of arms uh, to Iran and buying arms from Iran, has already expired. So uh, many of these terms are coming up more or less quickly. And we need, as much as I was a supporter of the JCPOA when it was signed, and I wrote articles to that effect, we need a more pronounced, more effective terms for the JCPOA to be able to make sure that whoever succeeds Khamenei, who is, as Alex said, observingly, he's 81 years old, will abide by it, uh, will be able to integrate Iran as part of the international community, probably within the Islamic uh, frame. Um, I don't think the regime is going anywhere anytime soon will moderate its regional meddling, its human rights abuses. These are all key issues that the Biden administration needs to tackle. And from what I see, from what I hear, what I have read, the people I have met, this is the way uh, they're going to approach this problem. I see that we're running short on time, but before we wrap up, are there any other key policy changes you'd like to see the next administration make? Uh, well, I think the good news is that the Biden victory will change the mood in Iran and bring hope. Uh, and that is very important. I mean, the Iranians are in a situation right now that they, they don't have flu shots. 
So, I mean, and I'm not saying this in a sense that there are no other shortages, but they are not used to these kinds of shortages. They always had access to everything. This is a country that had a good flow of uh, oil revenue. But the difficult situation uh, for Biden is that it is not clear if Iran will change its attitude. And I think one thing that Biden can give to the Iranian regime to start a new approach is to give them a face saving exit. Uh, from the current uh, crisis. Uh, because as Alex and Nazi elaborated, they are dealing with a lot of issues inside the country. Alex, before we wrap up, any final thoughts? What I would say, Alice, is the, the reality is Iran is an important actor in the Middle East. And the, re the reality is the idea that you can keep going at this situation we're in right now, no war, no peace, is really not sustainable for the uh, United States, uh, when it pursues its international interests, particularly vis-a-vis -vis some rising challenges like China. So you need to sort of start thinking about a sustainable solution. And I would urge whoever is taking over uh, in January 2021 in the White House to think of a bipartisan approach to this important foreign policy issue. You want the elders from the Republican and Democratic Party to talk about an Iran policy that pursues in a healthy fashion, American interest vis-a-vis -vis that country. But make sure that you don't go through what we went through the last five years, which is one, a Democratic president does one thing, which is totally undone by the next Republican president. That's not how you do long-term strategy vis-a-vis -vis a country that has been a torn on the side of the United States since 1979. To have a sustainable approach, you need an um, agreement in Washington among the key uh, foreign policy voices. What is American interest in Iran and how, how is the best way to go about securing those interests? And then that, I think, would be the best approach going forward. Great. We'll have to leave things there for today. But Alex, Nazila, Nazi, thank you all for joining the podcast. Thanks, Alistair. Thank you, Alistair. And thank you as well to our audience for listening in and to our production team for their work on today's program. We will see all of you next week. This has been a presentation of the Middle East Institute. To support MEI's programs and podcasts, please donate at www.mei.edu. Thank you for your support.